All my joys to this are folly, not so sweet as melancholy, said Robert Burton in a poetic synopsis of his treatise, The Anatomy of Melancholy, what it is, with all the kinds, causes, symptoms, prognostics, and several cures of it, in three main partitions with their several sections, members, and subsections, philosophically, medicinally, historically opened and cut up, first published in 1621. He definitely knew something back then. Hello, I'm Riele, and today I would like to share my older works while, as always, talking some nonsense. When I first started working in the lab a decade ago, I was surprised to see reagents and tools all around the lab labeled with the initials of people who no longer work there. Now, a decade later, it makes perfect sense. Some of these items are passed on to colleagues and not all labels are removed, some are simply forgotten. To me, people behind these initials were ghosts of the lab. Who was that Patricia who labeled her tweezers and scalpels with a skull and crossbones and wrote DON'T TOUCH in caps on her drawer? Later, I made some of these ghosts and they turned out to be perfectly alive in their present. But seeing their initials felt like remnants of something irretrievable and therefore romantic. The idea for this one sparked in November 2015. We have a tradition to celebrate people's birthdays as cakes in the kitchen, when everyone brings some cakes and fruit for the birthday person, and people gather in the lab's kitchen in the afternoon for some 30 minutes. Now, Berlin is not the sunniest of places, especially in winter, so at 3 p.m. on an overcast day with the lights off, the kitchen was light enough to set the table, but looked uniformly gray. I was loading the dishwasher and J.M. passing by me to the coffee machine made me raise my gaze from the dishes. Maybe the lighting made the gray of his temples more noticeable, or maybe the unusually informal setting. At the time, I was still new in the lab. But for a moment, I felt as if we weren't in the lab kitchen, as if it had been 20 years since we last met, and as if seeing him was the best thing that happened to me in a long while, even though he had been helping me to set up new micromanipulators just an hour earlier. It was a bliss of connecting to the past that is only possible in dreams. At the time, I thought it was like falling in love at first sight, but now that it happened to me, trust me, falling in love is not nearly as exciting. I had an idea to portray him in a superposition of past and present, to reflect the passage of time and scientific progress in his portrait. J.M. also had a peculiarity. When he wasn't interacting with people, he seemed austere, but when he was talking to someone, even calling tech support on the phone, his face softened and totally transformed. So I wanted to capture his interacting likeness. But at the time, my skills were largely lacking. In 2017, I asked him to pose for me. I wanted to position him against the horizontal lamp that would seem to pierce through his head, making it ambiguous whether it is light or gray hair on his temples. But the composition wasn't yet clear to me. At the end of 2018, I finally assembled a composition from those photographs and videos. But when I transferred the sketch to watercolor paper, I ruined it. Six months later, I returned to the sketch, transferred it again, and started painting. In horror. The format, by my standards, was gigantic. And this was my first portrait ever, if you don't count some doodles from 2011. In the intermediate stages, he looked awful. At first, like he'd been punched in the face, then like a 70-year-old joker, then like he was wearing lipstick. But I trusted the process, and in the end, it turned out much better than I could have expected. While working in color, I noticed that the watch became a meaningful detail, and that the scattered capillaries on the table, alluded to the half-peeled lemons in Dutch still life paintings, showing off luxuries and at the same time stating their transience. The lamp piercing through his head made me think about the rod that passed through Phineas Gage's skull, altering his personality and revolutionizing the way scientists of the time viewed brain function. What do I think of the final result? I love it. I captured his expression perfectly, and I love the color scheme that I stuck to for all consecutive pieces. What could be improved? 
Of course, there are many issues that could be improved. I could have paid attention to linear perspective and made fewer embarrassing mistakes. And I could have been more strategic about the composition, that green piped boy grows out of his shoulder and that socket under his chin looks like a weird beard. Let's go on to JL. I loved how comfortable she was in the confined space of the workshop, her figure largely in the dark with light coming from the window in the back and from the passage where the viewer was. I repainted her face three times and in the end she looks not much like herself, but at least like a human being and this is good enough for me as her pose makes her immediately recognizable. Before starting, I was afraid of painting the floor, because it is a large flat surface with a pattern that has to follow the perspective and not to draw too much attention to itself. Also, when I began painting, November became April, but who cares? I am happy with this one as well. The third one was SB. In early 2019, I saw SB at night copying data from a device PC leaning on a chair. I didn't want to paint a big black window with nothing in it, so I changed the lighting for more of a daytime scene that reveals the view from the window. While I am happy with the overall impression of this work, I made some embarrassing mistakes in perspective. They are even more embarrassing given that it is just one vanishing point within the frame. Most problems can be fixed fairly easily and I am going to attempt it now. I will add a bit more window frame on the top so that the upper corners look right and we'll try to fix the bottom part of the panel of the freezer. Otherwise, there are no more glaring mistakes. Here again, I was afraid of painting the floor. This is a recurring topic. The most difficult things to paint in watercolor for me are floors and walls. This floor is tricky as it is highly reflective uh, sheet vinyl of bright red color. So I wanted to hint at its local color and yet make it fit the general lighting. I mindlessly painted the paper bird glued to the window and then realized that I have a classic Annunciation scene here. A young woman reading with the Holy Spirit descending over her in the shape of a dove. And fitting to its title, it turned out to be almost prophetic. But as the dove was a paper cutout, the news it bore was equally disappointing. The project SB was working on was scooped by another research group. KLC cutting organs on the cryotone was surprisingly fast and easy, although I usually struggle with deeper tones in watercolor. I feel that I nailed her darker skin tone lit by a cool light source. You can actually read cell staining stuff, drugs and chemicals on the fridge. And then comes another combination of success and disaster, CD. This one was carefully staged. CD never did electrophysiology and never used the setup, but I wanted it to be a cryptic X-Men fan art. The thing is, I love the 1992 X-Men animated series and I wanted to create some fan art. And CD with her red hair and her composed air was a perfect fit for Jean Grey. I wanted to depict Jean Grey surrounded by hints at the love triangle between her, Cyclops and Wolverine. Most of these hints were present in reality. The red goggles and the red light in the microscope, as well as the wedding ring for Cyclops and the mug with the word Canada on it for Wolverine. I could not resist and added the tears on the curtains too. And again, I am incredibly happy with her face and horrified by linear perspective. I can reconcile most things except for the top of the Faraday cage, but alas, I cannot fix it. Uh, and if I try to remake it, I won't be able to recreate her face that well. I also seem to be afraid of cast shadows in 2020, as the chair is floating in the air. PD or Spiritus. This one was again imaginary. I saw the sunset one summer day and decided that TD was the best one to fit this dreamscape. I deliberately painted him without a lab coat. However, there is some realism to the spot on the floor, which is not blood, but ethanol, to clean the bottles. Again, I dreaded the floor and again I ignored cast shadows, but this time I feel that the floor is the best part of the piece. 
What is problematic again is linear perspective. The top of the incubator makes little sense. Getting ahead of myself, I should say that I learned this lesson in late 2021 and started rigorously double and triple checking it, but we are still in 2020. MP. It's funny that while the guys in the series are pretty neutral, almost all of the female portraits are either sexualized or at least voyeuristic. And this self-portrait was no exception. It was originally meant to be even more sensual, with me holding the tube in my mouth to apply pressure, but the angle didn't allow it. I am very happy with the drawers in the bottom right, but the piece overall is too light, especially the wall that I didn't dare to glaze further. And that doesn't allow the blue highlights to stand out as they should. Moreover, I forgot to add some reflected light, for example, here on the rim of the Faraday cage. That crossbeam is too light to be under the table. I'll try to fix it now. F you. This is another imaginary scene. You can't get inside the fume hood to get such a view, but I wanted to create a playing with fire scene. He is pipetting Athidium bromide, a fluorescent dye that intercalates between DNA base pairs and can be used to visualize DNA fragments in a gel and for the same reason may be carcinogenic. It turns out it is much safer than it was once thought to be, but many labs still switch to safer and more expensive alternatives. The orange light from the fume hood and the orange gloves create a stark contrast with the blue surroundings. The difficulty in this one was the visual paucity in the middle, where there is a big uniform shirt in focus but not much going on, while his face and the shelves are behind a sheet of glass. On the bright side, F.U. really looks like himself here. I feel that the next one, RPC Transformation, technically is the best piece of the series. When I saw her transforming bacteria wearing green gloves, I realized that she could be portrayed as is without inventing anything. The colors, lighting, reflections and reflected light from the red floor all added up to an interesting composition. But as I approached completion, I realized that apart from an aesthetic image, I don't see any meaning in it comparable to what I had put in the previous works in the series. But maybe it's just enough if it is pretty. Here I dreaded the yellow wreck the most, but it turned out quite well. I am tempted to tell you about bacterial transformation, but probably this will happen in some other video, as this one is already terribly long. Here the idea was to paint the golden hour with golden-haired FS. As I didn't want to make a straight view at the same window for the third time, I changed the angle to again something impossible in reality, as there is a wall where the viewer is standing. I feel that I removed too much of a mess from the table and the whole thing looks a bit empty, but there are three elements that I am happy about. The reflection of the lamp, the soles of her shoes, and the lab coat tucked into a chair that I saw some other time in some other room. MZ used to do ballet when she was a kid, so I thought that a bit of pin-up balancing on an elephant foot was fitting. Again, I tried to create a golden hour kind of lighting with illuminated gel chambers in the foreground, but this time it looks a bit too artificial. And finally, KF. This one remained a sketch for about two full years. The lighting here is insane and I don't think I nailed it. The viewer is an illuminated room with a lamp reflected in the window that separates the two rooms. She is groping for the switch on the thermocycler and seeing her reflection in the glass pane imagines someone coming from behind embracing her, but maybe also blindfolding or even strangling her, hence the turtleneck. My favorite part here are these two markers. KF was finished in October 2022 and after 12 pieces I decided to take a break from the series. I may paint more lab interiors in the future, also at other locations and maybe with a slightly different color palette, as by the 10th portrait I could not stand mixing the same four colors to create a gray. If you are interested in a separate video about the palette that I used for this series and the one I am using now for the Natural History Museums, please let me know in the comments. 
While I am retouching the two pieces that can be improved with minor edits, I will tell you a few additional reasons that cemented Sweet Initials as the name of the series. Why are they initials? After all, I am not trying to protect the model's identities, and I could have come up with less obscure, catchier titles. Yet they had to be initials. Scientific knowledge is inherently esoteric. Not in the sense that it's tied to something supernatural, but because it's only accessible to a small group of people. At the very least, because most people don't have an extra decade to specialize in a certain scientific field. And initials, as opposed to full names, create a sense of belonging to a certain society, almost a secret circle, within which everyone knows each other and therefore doesn't need to spell out names. Initials express a sweet feeling of being part of something bigger, whether it's a single lab, institute, tradition, or the scientific community as a whole. One more reason these initials seem sweet to me is that the first two portraits, JM and JL, contain letters from my favorite part of the alphabet. I am not a synesthete, but the letter J is light brown to me, slightly shiny like hair, L is steel and M is of Prussian blue color. If we fill in the blanks, K is black, not the shiny black, but swart, and N is emerald green, while no other letter, either in Cyrillic nor in Latin script, bears any color associations for me. If you are still with me, thank you for watching. Please like or dislike this video. Share your thoughts in the comments. Every reaction, either positive or negative, matters. Share this with your scientifically inclined friends, and I'll see you in the next video.